शुभम काफले दांग डिस्ट्रिक्ट को बन्नु भाई को समारु बनी ओह ओके ओके अगर उनसे ज्वाइन होने ज्वाइन कर देगा उनसे क्या कुरा अब एंड एटलिस्ट स्पीकर हरो स्टूडेंट स्पीकर हरो तो लाइनअप भाई को भाई साझे लो होने वाले को पांच क्यों भाई एक जना श्रीशा आचार्य जी बिपिन रितेश सुरुचि मनीष Ibu Barsa. So, Satoda presentation charge lai hagi. So, I think we should begin, right? Hello. Doctor Wagle le tya verify karnu bas sabey aunu baas hagi bilayi bhai bhai ni aru atwa. अगर ऑलमोस्ट है उन्होंने सही दिया जानते हो वाणी ज्वाइन होते हैं उन्होंने सा हमी फर्स्ट का तो लास्ट प्रेजेंटर होता है उनसे ते वाले शुरू करता है उनसे ओके आज रात फर्स्ट फर्स्ट का दूसरा थिंक टा प्रेजेंटर हो रहे हैं अब आइलेवल आज रात ज्वाइन करते हैं उन्होंने सा उनसा शुरू से इंगाल ओके नमस्कार सभी म आयोवा स्टेट यूनिवर्सिटी में काम कर यो नापा को आरसीबीसी रिसोर्स एंड कैपेसिटी बिल्डिंग कमिटी को करेन्ट चेयरमेन हो दिस प्रोग्राम टुडे दैट वी आर गोइंग टू हैव इज इज अ रिजल्ट ऑफ वेरी यू नो अलमोस्ट टू इयर्स ऑफ हार्ड वर्क by NAPA executive and by the RCBC, the committee itself and the uh, members. Uh, so I, I would like to quickly invite the current uh, members of RCBC committee to quickly uh, uh, tell your name and raise your hand, maybe, uh, Dr. Manoj Karki, uh, we could start with you and then uh, RCBC members. Uh, quickly introduce yourself and then uh, we'll move on. Hello, everybody. This is Manoj Karki from Washington State University. Hi, this is Ramzi from Ramzi Imri from Michigan State University. Hello, Namaste. Uh, this is Adit Tekhanal from uh, Tennessee State University. Do we have, uh, and we also, maybe they have not joined, uh, the members, uh, Leela Khatiwada ji from uh, Indiana. Uh, we also had Surendra Kesi, Dr. Surendra Kesi, uh, who is in Nepal currently. Uh, did I miss anybody in the members? I think that's it. So, all right, uh, RCBC committee and uh, the NAPA executive uh, welcomes you, all of you, uh, to this uh, NAPA sponsored research mini grant uh, project conference. Um, if we had our way, or if, if the coronavirus had not disrupted everything uh, in our life last uh, several months, uh, this conference, this uh, project uh, presentations would have been part of our NAPA uh, annual con biannual conference uh, in person. We wanted to celebrate the research uh, our wonderful students uh, had done, have been doing with the little help of NAPA. So we were planning to have a special session in that conference, uh, which now let's, this is a part of that uh, uh, celebration and conference uh, that uh, now has moved on to virtual. All right, so um, in this effort, I, I definitely have to thank uh, the tireless efforts of uh, Dr. Leela Karki, the then um, 
pres president of this uh, Napa executive, uh, uh, he really put together dollar by dollar asking for donations. And this is the member, basically members put together a dollar, a few dollar, $10, $20, putting together for the benefit of, uh, you know, trying to help uh, and, and initiate the collaborations between Napa as well as various uh, research institutes in Nepal. Uh, in, 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 the, in, in doing so, uh, with a novel cause of uh, training and providing resources, whatever we could uh, uh, to the students who are the future of uh, Napa as well, okay? So before I invite uh, Dr. Mega Parajali for quick, uh, uh, you know, um, his statement as well as moderation of the session, I would like to quickly remind here the, the, the presenting uh, students that uh, their presentation is of total 12 minutes, uh, including question answers. So you should try to finish in eight to nine minutes basically, and keep time about two to three minutes time for uh, question answers. And the general audience, uh, we really appreciate you being in here. Uh, and supporting Napa as well as supporting the students, researchers uh, by being here. Uh, please uh, use your comment boxes, uh, depending on whatever platform you are using, either Zoom or YouTube or even Facebook. We are, we are moderating these comment boxes for questions and comments. So a few of these question comments will be picked up and, and asked uh, by the moderator to the presenter at the end of their presentation. All right, so with that, I'd like to invite Dr. Mega Parajuli for his uh, uh, few words, as well as uh, start of the sessions and moderation as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Mega, sir, please. Thank you, Dr. Lomsal, for a uh, uh, brief overview of our program. Uh, namaskar, Savai uh, uh, Napa member who jo joined Nubai, sir. Uh, Nepal was a Jun researcher who joined in Vasa Sopegolagi Mo Amrajago Karikrama Amantron Gorna Sansu. My name is Meganath Parajuli. Uh, I am with uh, Texas AM University. Uh, I am professor of entomology, cropping systems, uh, agricultural sciences, and I am located in Lubbock, Texas. I am currently the president of uh, Association of Nepalese Agricultural. Professionals of Americas, in short, Napa. Yaru Sabaila in Napa Gobarem Bidhi Ununsa. Without making uh, my speech too long, I just uh, would like to uh, invite you to invite you to this program and uh, would like to acknowledge a uh, few groups of people, few individuals, uh, and we'll get the program going. Uh, first of all, I uh, I salute RCBC committee, uh, all the members uh, you have already introduced for your uh, uh, work in this program, right from the solicitation of proposals, meticulous review of proposals, selection of the best proposals. Out of 32, we had uh, 15 pr proposals uh, funded. Uh, <clears throat> that was a really awesome uh, responsibility you carried on on behalf of Napa Executive Committee and entire Napa. Mm -hmm. We thank you for that service. And the midterm review you conducted that gave us the, uh, the uh, really the, the assessment of uh, our program. It was the very first of its kind that we have done. That was exceptional. Uh, and then current Napa Executive Committee, uh, we just began only a couple months ago, uh, but the support and hopefully continuing support for this uh, is uh, commendable. All the Napa members joining uh, for this uh, journey we are in. And more importantly, donors and sponsors, uh, Dr. Lomsal already, already indicated that uh, without uh, individual support, and trust in what we are doing, this could not have been possible. Uh, so I thank you personally to all those uh, sponsors for this uh, program. And uh, 
when all these entities are involved in this, the, the major element of the success of this program uh, is because of the student researchers or all the researchers, not only all the students are researchers, there are faculty and uh, other professionals. Uh, they are the major element of uh, this program and the advisors, both advisors residing in North America as well as local advisors residing in Nepal. I think the culmination of all these elements, all these resources and all these uh, individuals made this, uh, made this program uh, really unique and successful program. Uh, and uh, we hope this is the very first cohort of our uh, research mini grant, uh, mini grant ORD uh, symposium. This is a two day symposium, seven people today, I think seven or eight people tomorrow. Uh, and uh, I hope there will be other people uh, uh, continuing to join and taking advantage of uh, this enormous sharing of uh, knowledge and information. And um, I also urge the speakers today as well as tomorrow's speakers to um, kind of send this information to your friends, other teachers, professors, colleagues, uh, and uh, request them to listen to what uh, excellent uh, research you have done because you want to share this and uh, make this uh, known to your colleagues. Uh, having said that, uh, on behalf of uh, uh, close to 300 active NAPA members and 56 members from Nepal itself. I uh, uh, would like to invite everyone to this program and I'm going to begin this soon. But before I uh, introduce the first speaker, those students and uh, those listeners who have not been NAPA members or who you know that they are your close colleagues, uh, they are that they are unaware of or they are not yet NAPA members, I urge you to and request you to um, uh, convey our uh, uh, request and message to those folks to join NAPA and uh, be under the large uh, agricultural professionals. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. With that, uh, let's begin. Are we ready, Dr. Gemiria? Yes, uh, Dev, uh, Dr. Dev, you will, uh, Dr. Dev Powell will be uh, uh, handling the present uh, slides. Dr. Powell, are you ready? Uh, Dr. Dev Powell, mute voice. We are ready. Eh? Ready. Okay. Go. Good. Okay. Let's welcome our uh, first speaker, uh, Barsha Bastola. Uh, representing or from, even though current she is in college station, Texas, I just learned she's from TUIAS. Um, the title is Management of Fruit Not Nematode in Tomato. Please go. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Namaste, everyone. I am Borsa Bastola from Institute of Agriculture and Animal Science, MRMC ILAM. The title of my research is Management of Fruit Not Nematode in tomato. Root knot nematodes is an important disease caused by Meloidogyne species. This disease occurs in nearly all regions of the country and on mostly all plant species. In 2006, 2000, according to the 2006-2007 NARC annual report, an average of 30% tomato fruits production was reduced by nematodes in Hemzakaski. The problem of nematode has been increasing rapidly due to year-round cultivation in plastic tunnel. And similar is the case in case of Hemzakaski. The objective of my study, of my research is to study the effect of soil amendments on root knot nematode infestation in tomato and its yield in materials and method. Firstly, the nematode infected soil and root galls were collected from Devi San High Tech Farm, Hemja Kaski, which is under the supervision of Prime Minister Agriculture Modernization Project, Vegetable Super Zone Kaski. 
the root knot nematode infestation in soil were confirmed by extraction of meloidogyne via gravimetric method at Regional Plant Protection Laboratory, Kaski. The greenhouse experiment was conducted in completely randomized design with four replications. And it was conducted in Regional Plant Protection Laboratory greenhouse itself. Talking about the treatment details, there were total nine treatments used. Treatment number one was sterilized soil control. Treatment two, unamended soil or infected soil. Treatment three, mustard seed cake at the rate 1%. Uh, treatment number four, poultry manure 2%. Treatment number five, vermicompost 2%. Treatment six, mustard seed cake 0.5% plus poultry manure 1%. Treatment seven, Mustard seed cake, 0.5%, vermicompost, 1%. Likewise, treatment eight, bionematicide, and treatment nine, nanosilver hydrogen peroxide. All treatments were applied in soil two weeks prior planting, prior transplanting. The tomato cultivar used was Srizana. Similarly, the pot size, the Pot size was 25 into 20, 20 centimeter square. Uh, the seedlings that were transplanted in the pots were 16 days old, and two plants were maintained per pot. The pots were replicated four times per treatment. Observation taken uh, Suit length, root length, root gall, the number of root gall, and ale was observed. All observation except yield were taken at 60 days after transplanting. Yield was taken from 40 day after transplanting to 60 day after transplanting. Now, I like to talk about the, uh, the results of my results of my research. Uh, we found the reduced suit length in the nematode infested plants. We can see that the sterilized soil has the highest suit length. And the second uh, highest suit length is of the poultry manure. From this, we can conclude that the nematode infestation re significantly reduced the suit length in tomato plants. Now talking about the root length, uh, there was no significant difference in the root length of the tomatoes, uh, tomato plants. Similarly, uh, poultry manure 2% was found to reduce the number of root galls in tomato plants significantly. The second followed is bionematicide. Similarly, the third one is mustard seed cake, uh, 1%. Uh, similarly, the highest yield was found in the soil amended with the poultry manure at the rate 2%. Next. Result and discussion continued. Uh, nematode infestation in tomato plants was found to reduce the suit length significantly. Uh, similarly, there was no significant difference in root length. Likewise, the lowest root gall were observed in poultry manure amended soil, followed by bionematicide and mustard seed, uh, mustard seed cake, respectively. Uh, the Nitrogen content in the poultry manure can be rapidly converted to ammonium nitrogen. The ammonia produced has been shown to kill plant parasitic nematodes. Likewise, the phenolic content in mustard seed cake helps to kill the soil inhabiting nematodes. So this may be the reason for the reduced, uh, reduced number of the root galls in the tomato plants. Likewise, the highest yield was found in poultry manure amended soil. The conclusion of my research is among the soil amendment used in the experiment, poultry manure had the lowest nematode infestation and highest yield. Likewise, mustard seed cake and vermicompost also reduced the nematode infestation significantly. These are the glimpses of my research. 
in the first picture uh, i have used uh, root calls to i have ground i have grinded it in the mortar and pestle and so that i could get some uh, nematodes the fresh nematodes and i have uh, kept in a petri dish and later we uh, we studied it in the stereo microscope in the second picture uh, i have used the gravi gravimetric method to isolate the nematodes in this i have used a beaker a pipe and a funnel and i have placed the swell in a filter paper at above next uh these are the observation we got in the stereo microscope in the plant protection laboratory the first picture we kept just 10 g of swell in the gravimetric method and you can see here there are bunch of nematodes which were readily moving and only in this we found more than 200 nematodes in the 10 g swell and in the second picture we have uh, pinned only uh, we have isolated only two from this bulk nematodes to study thoroughly about this and these are the individual two nematodes we saw in the stereo microscope in the laboratory Uh, the first picture is that we were preparing for the pots in the greenhouse of the same laboratory in the kaski and the second picture is that uh, this is the uh, root of tomato plant uh, in which the soil was not amended and the number of galls was numerous in this roots this is a root of tomato under different treatments uh, we can clearly see from treatment number 1 to treatment number 9 i have placed this uh, respectively and uh, this is the study conducted in the laboratory of plant protection in kaski uh, finally uh, i would like to thank my local advisor mr ganesh rawat sir and napa advisor for mr mukti gimire uh, similarly region regional plant protection laboratory kaski for providing laboratory facilities and greenhouse for the research prime minister agriculture modernization project uh, project implementation unit kaski for providing information about the nematode infestation in the himza of kaski district and the most importantly association of nepalese agriculture professionals of americas napa for providing me fund so that i could carry out my research and uh, finally uh, in my research for further verification the field experiment is to be done so by saying this i would like to end thank you Thank you for your great presentation, Barsha. Doctor De Paul, do I have few minutes to pose our question? Yes, yes. Uh, more than you have two minutes. Okay. Uh, Barsha, there is one question from uh, one of the professors. Uh, the question is, uh, what chemical or component of poultry soil helped control nematodes? What's the reason behind it? Ah. Uh, what component okay thank you for the question sir uh according to the research in the aps as i reviewed uh the nitrogen available in the poultry manure is readily converted to the ammonium and the ammonium is converted to ammonia and this ammonia is uh is found to reduce the uh nematode infestation in the tomato roots significantly in the past research is conducted by aps and also there are a couple of short questions from another professor uh, what is the sterilized treatment and what was the bio uh, nematicide uh in the sterilized treatment i just uh, bought the same soil from the same place and we placed it in the autoclave for 2 hours so that the whole soil was completely sterilized and we don't have any of the nematodes or any of the microbes in the soil and in the bionematicide uh, 
it is the commercial bionematicide which is made in India and it comes in the name of nematicine and it is mostly used by the farmers in that uh, Himza, Himza of Kaski. There are a lot of questions, but let me uh, continue to ask until Dr. Powdell stops me. Uh, Let's stop. You, okay. Let me ask one very quick. Okay. Did you see any visible symptoms of nematode above? Uh, is from YouTube. Sir? Uh, okay. We might stop here. I think I might. What we might do is there are lots of questions, so we might kind of send this to all the speakers after the uh, symposium, so that uh, they will uh, they will at least know what are the queries from the from the audience. Thank you. We'll move on to the next uh, speaker. Thank you, Basai, again. Thank Our you. next presenter is uh, Ibu Devkota uh, from AFU. Title is first Napa sponsor research mini grant. Project conclusion. Where is the title? Uh, okay, right here. Am I allowed to screen share my presentation? This was before, uh, sent before edit. edit. Ah, okay. Am I allowed to screen share? Uh, Dr. Powdell, how do we do? Uh, this is uh, Dr. Kimire uh, makes her. Uh, are there many changes? If not, let us uh, continue what we have. Will, will that be okay? Uh, I, I mean, there are changes. Uh, this was like a very, uh, I was advised to change this by uh, Dr. McCarthy. And I sent you my corrected presentations, but uh, <laughs> we have my okay, first why presentation. Why Excellent. If you allow me, let me propose. Why don't she send the presentation to us so that we can um, I mean, uh, have it and uh, set in our system and ask the uh, speaker or whatever. Okay. Uh, I have sent you my present, uh, my corrected presentation. I, I mean, I think uh, it's... Uh, Raju Jaksha, I do you share your screen, Garna Garun, sir? Not, uh, let's do that rather than losing our time. All right, sure, sure. Yes, thank you. Green button, we're gonna serve. Uh, am I audible and visible to everyone? Yes, very good. Please go. Okay, okay. Namaste. I am grateful to all of you present here for uh, contributing to my learning experience. My name is Ibu Dekota. I am an intern for Bachelor's in Veterinary Science and Animal Husbandry, uh, uh, Agriculture and Forestry University, Chitron, Nepal. My local advisor is Dr. Hombadu Bursmith, um, who is a head of Department of Microbiology and Parasitology, Faculty of, Agricultural, uh, Faculty of Animal Science, Veterinary Science and Fisheries, AFU, Chitron, Nepal. My NAPA advisor is Dr. Omar Karki, a research extension Professor and a state extension like livestock specialist, Tuskegee University, Tuskegee, Alabama, USA. The topic of my uh, project funded by NAPA is Socioeconomics of Sustainable Dairy Farming, a case of Bioquist Extension in Nepal. Um, the presentation outline contains a short introduction, few lines to address statement of problem, objectives, materials, and methods used to complete my research, results, and its discussion, conclusions drawn from my research, and few suggestions. Introduction. Nepal is an agriculture country where 66% of the people are engaged in farming that is subsistent, crop integrated with livestock according to FAO. Major milk production system in Nepal according to Right to Access Nepal are traditional subsistence and marketing commercial or semi-commercial. Uh, dual access system for price milk exists in Nepal uh, on which and on an average it contains 3% fat and 8% SNF in a raw milk according to NEPC 2014. Statement of problem. Traditional milk production system is dominant that involves high cost of production compared to our neighboring countries supported by NEPC 2014. The milk uh, price farmers are paid with not sufficient production cost according to the March 2018. Major drawbacks to commercialization of dairy sector are less productive animals, low milk quality, and dual access of milk pricing according to Tinsuna 2010. 
The objective of my study was to evaluate the socio-economics of traditional dairy farms in Bharat for 16 Chit 1 Nepal. Methods and materials uh, are explained as below. Bizanagar and Gari villages are um, the two study sites uh, uh, where I conducted my study, and they lie in Bharatpur 16, Nepal. Bharatpur 16 is indicated with an arrow in a Bharatpur metropolitan city map as shown in the figure below. Uh, I, for the data collection, I used both the primary and secondary sources of data. For the primary sources of data, I conducted household survey of a sample size of 60 farmers. I conducted key informant interview and made a field observation, and these all were done between September and November 2019. For the secondary source of data, I collected farmers' record from milk producers' cooperatives, which had their data on their farm, uh, farm date price, their uh, revenue from, from selling milk, and the uh, fat percentage and milk, uh, SMF percentage of their milk. And the uh, data dated between September 2018 and September 2019 was collected. Uh, I conducted data analysis for a simple descript, uh, descriptive analysis using Microsoft Excel 2010. For economic variables, I uh, calculated of I, using the data and I calculated the economic variables like marketing margin, research share, and benefit cost ratio. The problems and satisfaction of the farmers at the study site were evaluated using indexing and rank, ranking using an eight point scale value. Now, moving on to the result and discussion section of my presentation, the current study concluded uh, that uh, showed that the family size uh, was 4.60 members with 2.63 male and 2.26 female members. Uh, majority of the respondents belong to Brahmin and Chetri ethnic group, followed by Jamjati ethnic group. Hinduism was followed by 95.8% of the population and 4.2% 4, 4 of the population was Buddhist. Illiteracy rate of female was 49.4% and that of male was 28.1%, indicating the literacy rate of male was higher at the study site. Uh, both the male and female members, a majority of them were farmers who depended on agriculture for their livelihood. Uh, characteristics of the dairy cow is showed by the following table. Uh, the current study showed that uh, the cow's head per household was 1.67. They had average body, uh, body, condition, score, body condition score was 2.69, which was moderate. Uh, the average cow is reared in the study site was 4.94 years, and the average parity of the dairy cattle population was 2.68. The breed reared at the study site was Jersey cross. Coming to economic variables, this table explains the variable cost of milk production per household per year. The variable input that I chose considered for study were cost of straw, fodder seed, concentrate, cost of medicine, breeding, land renting, labor, and transportation. And the variable cost of milk production per household per year was calculated to be uh, Nepalese currency uh, 152,446 rupees. Moving towards the farm gate price and amount of milk sold per household per year, which were uh, calculated on the basis of the farmer's record collected from the milk producer cooperatives. The current study showed that on an average, um, the farmers received a rupees 48 a per liter of raw milk, and the annual milk sale per household was uh, a to a total of 2,652 liters. Moving towards the gross revenue from the cattle farming, the outputs from the cattle farming were milk and fertilizer, and on an average, the uh, a household sold 2,652 liters of milk and two tractors of fertilizers, and the gross revenue from cattle farming was calculated to be 138,129 rupees per year. And the cost of milk production was calculated to be rupees 57.49 per liter at the study site. And this was more than the farm gate price received by the farmers at the study site. Uh, this is a schematic illustration of the supply chain of the milk in the study site. Uh, we, as we can see that the farmers, they provided milk to the milk producers cooperative, or they can also sell the milk directly to the private dairy processing unit or to the consumers. The collected milk from the milk producers cooperative were supplied to the private dairies or to the processing units, or also sold locally to the consumers. And the processing units supplied uh, milk to the, the local retailers and consumers, either fresh or uh, processed and packed. Now, the benefit cost ratio of the milk production. The benefit cost analysis showed that each household faced a, a loss of 14,317 rupees annually. Uh, the benefit cost ratio of the traditional milk production system at the study site was 0 0.90. Since it was less than unity, we can declare that this was on profitable business. Uh, however, the, uh, uh, the people at the study site continued with the tradition, and the elder generation uh, reported a remark that. Uh, 
the traditional cattle rearing was part of their lifestyle and the cattle uh, was seen as a source of milk for daily household daily consum milk consumption in the household moving towards marketing margin and producers here the, um, the current study showed that the average farm gate price received by the farmer was to be 48 per liter the retailer's price was to be 90 per liter creating a marketing margin of rupees 42 per liter the price uh, spread analysis showed that uh, the trader share of the final selling milk price was 47 percent and the producer share was 53 percent but to know whether the margin are remark reasonable it is necessary to understand the nature and composition of marketing cost and this is not uh, covered by my research now problems in the traditional milk production system based on the answers of the respondent low milk price uh, price was the problem ranked as first by majority of the farmers whereas availability of concentrate for feeding was ranked as the least important problem the satisfaction from traditional milk production system farmers were found to be mostly satisfied with the annual milk production however satisfaction levels seem to be decreasing towards annual revenue from milk and veterinary services provided at the study site uh, conclusions the respondents character from the study site included almost equal male and almost equal females illiteracy rate of female was higher than male and agriculture was a major source of income each household sold 2,652 liters of milk and two tractors of manure annually. Milk production was unprofitable and the household faced loss of rupees 14,317 annually. The market channel at the study site included farmers, milk producers, cooperative processors, retailers, and consumers. Market margin was high for the raw milk and market channel may be inefficient for fresh milk. Low milk price received by the farmers was the major problem. Moving towards some suggestion. Adjust the sell price for milk based on routine analysis of the production cost. Train the farmers for producing and marketing value-added products like ghee for better profits. Shorten the marketing channel of fresh milk for which further study is recommended. Educate farmers on improved breeds, clean milking practices, and standard management practices. Inform and encourage farmers to apply for possible government incentives for improved dairy enterprise. Acknowledgements. I am indebted to the people of Visayanagar and Gadi for the support um, during the study period. I am also utterly grateful to the continuous support, guidance, and encouragement from my advisors. I am thankful for NAPA and RCBC for providing me with an opportunity to test my boundaries and learn from the experience during the research period. I am also very uh, grateful to my beloved parents and friends who have been a constant source of inspiration and love. This is a glimpse of research um, of conducting household surveys and the milk analyzer and computer record used for uh, uh, achieving the farmer's record. Uh, this is my end of the presentation. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Pordell, do I have time to pose some questions? Let me go ahead and pose one anyway. Uh, there are several questions. So we will uh, submit this to you, uh, Ibu, after the, the seminar is over. So you can address them and we will convey these to uh, our listeners uh, at a later time. Very quickly, uh, what's your uh, marketing model, uh, dairy marketing model during this uh, COVID situation? That's the first question. Right now? Yeah. Uh, it's the same. Uh... Uh, the order, the farmers always uh, get a, uh, sell their milk to the milk producers cooperative and the milk producers at uh, the uh, the locality I chose uh, the every uh, concerned marketing uh, pieces they are very close by so the milk producers cooperative sell the milk to the processing outlets the processing outlet to the local shops and retailers. Yeah, let's go ahead and uh, close this uh, presentation. And again, there are so many questions that we cannot address at the time, but we will either uh, uh, use those during our plenary session uh, uh, later on. Uh, and if we cannot finish those, then uh, we will get them answered later. Thank you very much again, Ibu. Thank you, sir. Next, uh, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Manish Gautam from AFU. Uh, title is Comparative Efficacy of Different Insecticides Against Cucurbit Fruit Fly on Bottle Gourd, bottle gourd in Salampur 8, Kabilasi Municipality, Sarlai District, Nepal. Manish, you are up. Thank you all. It's me, Manish Kautam from Agriculture and Forestry University. Uh, without delay, let me start my presentation. Um, 
My research is entitled Comparative Efficacy of Different Insecticides Against uh, Cucurbit Fruit Fly, Atrocera Cucurbitae, and Portal Guard. Uh, the research was carried out um, in Salimpur, Salimpur of Kabilasi in Sarlai district. And while being there, the research was directed uh, to our certain objectives. Uh, next, please. Uh, the objectives of the research were uh, to compare the efficacy of different insecticides against fruit fly. And uh, under this general objective, uh, some specific objectives were added uh, to assess the infestation level by counting the cucurbit fruit fly's number um, in what, what was the population of the cucurbit fruit fly. It was assessed. Similarly, uh, the nature and the level of damage was also observed. And uh, the main objectives were to minimize the cucurbit fruit fly infestation in portal guard and to maximize the yield. Similarly, uh, the research also intended to compare the effects of several botanicals and the chemical pesticides which are available currently in the market against fruit fly uh, for portal guard. Next please. Okay, metals and methodology. Um, actually, you know, when I was in the district, the farmers, uh, were recommended from uh, Krishi Kan Kendra Agricultural Knowledge Center and, uh, and vegetable zones uh, to purchase um, Malathion for their um, bottle guard production. But uh, the chemical insecticides and botanicals which were available in the market were so limited, uh, the farmers uh, had to resort to whatever recommendations were given by the agribed centers. Therefore, I selected few of the treatments um, which were available at that time. Um, the treatments are spinocide, dichlorobus, lambda salutrin, zolmol, multinim, which was a uh, nim oil based acid reactant. And finally, the last treatment was control. And the research was conducted under randomized complete block design with six treatments. Um, under Tata Kali, uh, there were three different sprays in three different uh, phases of the portal guard growth and development. Um, first spray was given during flowering stage. Which, uh, which coincided with the preset stage and data were collected on 40th, 7th day and 10th day after the first spray. The second spray was done 10 days later such that it coincided with the post-set stage and the data were collected in similar manner on 30th, 7th day and 10th day. Um, the last spray, that is third spray was done 10 days later at harvest stage where, and the data were collected respectively. The, the fruits were finally harvested um, after third spray and uh, various primary data were obtained from the observations. Uh, they were subjected to analysis using RStudy and data were entered using Microsoft Excel. Um, and uh, the species was uh, regulated and maintained so that the uh, cross uh, contamination of insecticides were prevented. Next slide. Okay. Um, the results from my uh, research are presented here. Um, on the nature of damage, uh, I studied mainly uh, the stages in which the fruit fly uh, caused most damages and what kind of symptoms and signs were seen on the, on the bottle guard. Um, the Bactrocera cucurbiti, that is uh, cucurbit fruit fly, mainly attacked three stages of bottle guard. Um, that is preset stage, post set stage, and harvest stage. Next slide, please. Okay. And the uh, cucurbit fruit fly, mostly female flies, uh, damage the flowers, female flowers or ovaries during preset stage. And the uh, post set fruits uh, that are less than 100 gram weight were also damaged by the sharp oviposition uh, ovipo of the female flies. Later, in har during harvest stage, the marketable fruits were damaged and uh, they rot on the vines, and most of them dropped on the ground as well. Uh, similarly, the brutal grouts, which are ready to harvest, were damaged by fruit fly and rotten. Um, when the uh, brutal guard was cut and the cross section was observed, few maggots could be seen in the rotten fruits as well. But I could not observe the eggs uh, at that time. Next slide. Um, no. um, this is the uh, LST test of insect distribution, um, which shows the uh, population of the insect uh, during the first spray. 
after first spray on third, tenth, or on third and tenth day, and the Spanish side, Diclorobus and Lambda Silocene were statistically on par with each other, but superior to all the treatments. Whereas on seventh day, Spanish side was found most effective, followed by Diclorobus and Lambda Silocene. Similarly, in second spray, Spanish side was most effective um, on third, seventh, and tenth day after the second spray, and Diclorobus and Lambda Silocene were on similar. Uh, on third and seventh day, while di while diclorobus was superior to lambda silocin on tenth day. Um, similarly, on third spray, um, in third spray, spinocide was superior to all other insecticides. Um, on third, seventh, and tenth day after the third spray, which was followed by diclorobus and lambda silocin. Azatiractin was, however, found superior to Zolmol on the tenth day after the spray in controlling the number of insects per plant. Next slide. So this slide presents the damage assessment at preset stage, post-set, and harvest stage. In preset stage, spinocide was found most effective in controlling the preset pre damage in bottle guard with least number of damaged ovaries per plant on third, seventh, and tenth day after first spray. Zolmol and azadiractin were also superior to control, but inferior to lambda silocin. Uh, Diclorobus was superior to lambda silocin, but less effective than spinocide. During post set stage, when fruits were less than 100 gram weight, spinocide was most effective in minimizing the number of damaged post set fruit pro, pro, um, fruits per plant. Other treatments were similar in effect towards post set damage, con, uh, damage um, but all the insecticides were superior to control. Similarly, during harvest stage, um, the plants sprayed with spinocide and dichlorobus had a least number of market, unmarketable fruits per plant, followed by lambda silocin. Um, Zolmol and azatiractin spray were statistically on par with each other in terms of number of unmarketable fruits per plant, but they were inferior to lambda silocin. So in this way, botanicals were somehow um, uh, less effective than the chemical insecticides. Um, during harvest stage, in the um, span when the treatment was uh, when the observation was done on weight basis, the spinocide and diclorobus were most effective with lowest weight of unmarketable fruits per plant. Lambda silocin, zolmol, and azatiractin were statistically similar and superior to control treatment. In this part, um, the botanicals were uh, somehow um, on par with chemical uh, treatments and were very close on the um, results shown by the chemical treatments. Weight of marketable fruits highest in spinocide treated loss, followed by dichlorobus and lambda silocin. Um, in this aspect, all the treatments were significantly superior to control in each aspect. Next slide. So here, the percent infestation of damage um, by hookery fruit fly in bottle guard is shown. Uh, in control, the damage was as high as and 93% and 52.41% um, by fruit weight and number uh, basis. Similarly, spinocide showed lowest fruit damage, 67% and 27.288% on fruit weight and number basis, respectively. Uh, similarly, the damage of fruits under diglorobus treatment was statistically similar to spinocide, uh, while lambda silocin followed diglorobus. Um, 33.78% and 34.48% damage on fruit number and weight basis, respectively. Zolmol and azatiractin were similar in performance. Zolmol had 35.98% and 38.55% damage on fruit number and weight basis. Azatiractin had 35.49% damage by fruit number and 38.03% damage by fruit weight basis. Similarly, um, the highest yield was obtained uh, under Spanish side treatment. Um, uh, which was 16.41 kg per plant. And uh, the, in control, the yield was only 11.68 kg per plant, while Zolmol um, and Azadiractin um, had obtained 14.03 kg per plant and 13.85 kg per plant yield respectively. So in this aspect, um, in terms of yield, Zolmol and Azadiractin were um, similar in effectiveness uh, for yield of portal guard to lambda silocin, but um, a bit poor to diglorobus and spinocide. Next slide. 
Um, under conclusion, it is evident from the research that cucurbit fruit fly causes heavy losses in the yield of bottle gourd, uh, which is about more than 50%. Uh, it is serious economic loss to the commercial farmers, but uh, spinocide, which is also a biopesticide, sold very few fruit infestation in, uh, in comparison to control on fruit and weight basis, which was followed by diglorobus, tolmol and azadiractin were somehow uh, less effective than spinocide and diglorobus, but they showed higher yield, which was comparable to the chemical insecticides. Uh, Zolmol was able to minimize the fruit fly damage in portal guard by 13.94% and 13.85% on weight and number basis, respectively, while azadiractin um, had 14.43% less damage on fruit number and 14.37% on fruit basis which co when compared to control. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay. Mm. I think Nate, Nate is a bit slow here. This research also compares the potential of botanicals and biopesticides in controlling the fruit fly infestation in bottle gourd. Uh, the data in this research are obtained from a single season, which limits the potential effect of botanicals and biopesticides over a long period of time. Of course, uh, the botanicals and biopesticides have positive effects on health, nature, and they don't have the possible problems of pest resurgence and resistance, uh, which are otherwise can be um, very serious problems under chemical insecticides. For the research on the effectiveness of botanicals and organic pesticides must be carried out to unravel their potential effect in fruit fly management. We can also practice mechanical methods of control, such as use of traps and uh, bagging of the bottle gourds, etc. Um, but chemical insecticides are um, uh, really uh, quick and uh, um, the results are seen with the naked eye by the farmers. So they are quite um, the farmers and further unravel the potential of botanicals so that chemical insecticides can be replaced and uh, we can move forward for profitable production and sustainable agriculture. Thank you. Thank you, Manish, for uh, great research and great presentation. But uh, I have one suggestion for you. Since uh, I believe yes, based sir. on the data I have, uh, you are uh, uh, doing BSc, AG, or finishing up. Uh, so you, based on that, this is a great presentation. But going forward, I suggest that uh, your slides uh, need some help. Uh, you don't need to present all those uh, five, six decimals, uh, you know, points and all that. Yeah, you can you can really kind of trim that into uh, succinct and uh, um, and a clearer presentation. Good work, but uh, even the okay. the last okay. summary okay. bullet points, uh, you don't need to give all those. So make those uh, smaller and clear bullets so that. Uh, the slides uh, are not as busy. So that's my uh, humble suggestion for you going forward. Thank you very much. We close this presentation and Thank let's- you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, let's bring uh, our next speaker. Okay. Uh, it is uh, Suruchi Sarma, correct? Am I? Yes, sir. Okay. Hello. Uh, yeah, Hello. Presentation, yeah, presentation is germ plasma evaluation of cowpea in case of Dang district uh, with uh, local advisor Manoj Basnet. I believe uh, advisor here is uh, uh, Dr. Bhandari, maybe. I don't have that info here. So, Suruchi, let's go. Hello, everybody. Namaste. It's me, Suruchi Sarma. BSc AG 8 semester student of Campus of Life Sciences. I am here the representative of my group. First of all, I would like to thank NAPA and Assistant Professor Mr. Manoj Basnit sir for providing us this opportunity and NAPA for funding us and giving this platform to share our knowledge. Well, the topic of my presentation is germ plasm evaluation of cowpea in case of Dang district. Next slide. Let's start with the introduction portion. Cowpea was originated in Africa and is an important vegetable crop of Nepal. Cowpea is a warm season crop, so the best suitable temperature for it is the 21 to 35 degrees centigrade. Cowpea 
consist of the root nodule, which have the rhizobium bacteria, which help them to fix the atmospheric nitrogen into the nitrate and nitrites. So the minimal input is sufficient for this crop. In Nepal, cowpea can be grown successfully both in spring, summer, and in rainy season. In the plain and hill, different cultivars respond differently according to the temperature and day length of the place where they are being grown. There are distinct cultivars for the spring, summer, and the rainy season. This, this here is the botanical classification of the cowpea. Next slide, please. Objective. The objective of our research are classified into the broad objective and the specific objective. The broad objective of our research is to evaluate the production performance and the adaptability of different germplasm of the vegetable cowpea in case of dung district. Specific objective to know the to know about the characteristic of different germplasm to find out the economic return that can be gained from the different germplasm. Next slide. Material and method. The free location where the research was conducted was the campus of life, the field of campus of life sciences, Tulsipur Dang. Horticulture Research Division Pokhara 5 Malepatan Kaski was the source of seed. The time period from sowing to harvest was second week of July to third week of October 2019. The design selected for this research was randomized com complete block design RCBD. There were seven treatments with the three replication of each. The method of sowing was line sowing. Two seed per spot was the Seed rate, the total plot size was 75 meters square. The individual plot size was 2.56 meters square. Space between the block was 0 0.5 and space between the treatment was 0 0.25. The spacing between row to row was 40, 40 centimeter and spaces between the plant to plant spacing was 20 centimeter. The agronomical practices, field preparation, uh, at first, the, uh, the field was deployed by the power tailor, all the weeds, stone, bricks, and harmful paste that can affect our resource, that can create the difficulties in our resource were removed. And the final field preparation was done after the first plowing, manures and fertilizer. As we know that the cowpea is a leguminous crop, so minimal input is sufficient. So 60 kg poultry manor per 75 meters square plus the 20s to 40s to 20 kg NPK per hectare was applied. Half the dose of urea was top dressed as a vessel dose and half after the third week of sowing. Intercultural operation, weeding and hoeing were do done. First weeding was done on the 15 days after sowing and the second was done after the 20 days of first weeding. Irrigation was done frequently about 15 to 20 days Bamboo stick were provided as a suitable support for the plant at the 30 days after showing. As in the research, we have the problem of aphid and pore borer. So to control them, cypermethrin 5% emulsified concentration was spread at 25 days of sowing, and then it was repeated after 15 days interval. Next slide, please. There were total 21 plot. Each plot consists of the 32 plant, five plant from each plot were taken as a sample, leaving the border plant. The sampling technique was simple, random sampling without the replacement. Parameter of the study were classified as the vegetative and the rep reproductive one. The vegetative parameter consists of plant height, number of branches, number of leaves, whereas the reproductive parameter include days of 50% flowering, number of pod per plant, pod length, pod weight, number of seed per pod, yield per plot, yield ton per hectare. After all the data of each parameter were recorded, then they were analyzed by the LDR version 2.0 software. Next slide, please. Result and the discussion portion, the table number first. It consists of all the vegetative, result of all the vegetative parameter. The, the germ plant, which gained the maximum plant height in 35 days after sowing was the long air bean, and the highest number of leaves and highest number of branches were re recorded in germ plasm IT86F-2062-5. Next, please. Table number two, which shows all the reproductive parameter of the cowpea. The germ plasm, which 
take lower or the minimum days for the 50% flowering was long had been highest number of pot per plant was recorded in IT07K-298-15. Longest pot length and highest pot weight was recorded in long had been highest number of seed per pot was recorded in Prakash. The final parameter, the yield parameter, yield ton per hectare was recorded in long had been. Next one, please. Summary and the conclusion. After evaluating the seven treatment with the three replication, we get the following result. The parameter plant height, highest was recorded in long air, lowest in IT07K-298-15. Number of leaf, highest in IT86F-2062-5, where lowest was in Malipatan first. Number of branches, highest was in IT86F-2062-5, lowest in Malipatan first. Days of 50% flowering was highest in Malipatan first and second lowest was in long had been. Number of pot per plant was highest recorded, recorded in IT07K-298-15 where lowest was in long had been. Pot length was highest in long had been where the lowest was in IT07K-298-15. Pot weight was highest recorded in long had been and lowest was in Gazelle body, body. Number of seed per pod was highest in Prakash, whereas lowest in IT07K-298-15. Total yield ton per hectare was highest recorded in long had been and lowest was in IT07K-298-15. After evaluating all these results, we came in a conclusion that the re release variety are superior in various parameters as compared to the pipeline one. We conclude that the re release variety long had been secure is position in the uh, in superior position in the various parameter as compared to the other one. Next one, please. This is the comparison table of previous research done by our research and the research done by us. The parameter plant height, days of 50% flowering, per length, per width, total yield per ton hectare was same in both the previous and this year, that is long had been, but there are some parameters which differ, differ in with the previous research. Number of leaves per plant and the number of branches highest was recorded in Gazale body in the previous year, whereas it was recorded it was recorded IT86F-2062-5 in this year. Number of pot per plant highest was recorded in IT07K-227-4 in the previous year, where as in this year, IT07K-298-15 was highest in this year. Number of seed per pot uh, in the previous year, it was the long air bin, where in this year, it was Prakas body. Next. After finishing this research as a recommendation to the farmer of the Dang district, we would like to recommend long air bin, gazelle body, and malipatin for the vegetable pro production. I, being highest among all the jumplas in the BC ratio, we would like to suggest the long air bin for getting the higher benefit since it has the highest benefit cost ratio, since the yield ton per hectare is also highest in the long air bin, it gives more production and in return, in an economic return that will help the farmer of Dang district to improve their economy. Next. These are the reference we have taken during, uh, for our research. These are some picture of our research doing some field work, the for, first picture. We are we are manuring the field. Second, con second picture demonstrate the yield of cowpea, and third one is the sticking sticking picture. Thank you. Okay, one question for you. Yes, sir. What might be the reasons for different results in two growing years in some variables? It might be the climate, climate change. Yeah, the question, I'm not sure. Uh, 
what was the intent of the question but uh, yeah i would expect the climate variability will create uh, different results uh, that's the reason that uh, yes sir. we have to do multi year research before we definitely uh, accept the results most of our research uh, presented today are one year data but uh, definitely multi year will give us a better confidence okay okay uh thank you very much this is excellent presentation actually and uh, i'll just make comment uh, uh for uh, suruchi that uh, uh, in her presentation she talked about actual application of the results and uh, you know being applicable to growers and so forth i think that was our uh, real intent that we want to make sure that uh, these research outcomes are ultimately uh, uh deliver to our outreach to growers thank you great presentation thank you sir okay. moving on to next um, we have uh, ritesh ja i think that presentation is shared directly ritesh kumar ja okay title is uh, influence of foliar application of gibberellic acid and naphthalene acetic acid on growth development quality yield fruit anatomy and seed setting of tomato under protected cultivation mr ja you go thank you namaste everyone it's me ritesh ja from agriculture and forestry university this is my research entitled as Influence of gibberellic acid and naphthalene acetic acid on performance of tomato in Kashi, Nepal. Without losing my time, I want to move to our introduction. Tomato, which is also a self-pollinated crop, was originated in the western coastal plain of South America and is known as the poor man's orange and ranked first in consumption as compared to other vegetables. Though it ranked first in consumption, its productivity is in the study area where i was assigned was quite lower than the national as well as the global productivity so the major problem that i encountered so your study site was the lower productivity and there were various reasons responsible for it like unfavorable weather conditions like high temperature and erratic rainfall that coincide with the flower and fruit development trait what happens exactly was that the higher temperature lead to the disruption of the protein translocation during the narrow period of male reproductive development as well as lead to the impaired physiological process in the fish tail so to overcome this problems there were two possible options one was the protected horticulture adoption of protected horticulture so that the conditions of unfavorable weather will be removed and the protected horticulture structure that was adopted in kashi was a naturally ventilated greenhouse and the second was the application of plant growth regulators like oxygen and zirconi that diminishes the activity of repressor proteins like ox ias and dela these repressor proteins usually do not allow to bind the gibberellic response gene as well as oxygen response genes and finally hinder the cell division and cell expansion which resulted in lower fruit growth which is clearly seen from the model integrating the role of oxygen and gibberellin in tomato so the objective is clearly understood by this discussion that the overall objective was to enhance the productivity of tomato by the use of gibberellic acid and naphthalene acetic acid with the following specific objectives like to determine the optimum level of gnna on growth and yield of tomato as well as to know the interaction effect of gnna on tomato without losing time i want to move to our the result part this is the effect of gibberellic acid and naphthalene acetic acid on plant health actually i have used the two factorial acid medium with four levels of gibberellic acid and naphthalene acetic acid comprising all together 16 treatments and uh, the four levels of gibberellic acid was 0 ppm 25 ppm 50 ppm 75 ppm same was the levels for the na what i observed was that the ga enhanced cell division and increased the plant height 
but the yen up to 25 ppm it has the same danger and beyond it the higher concentration depresses the activity of xylobutan in the trans glycosylase that decreases the cell permeability and finally lead to depress the cell division and contribute toward the enlargement in the mature parenchyma cells that lead to the massive tissue proliferation inhibiting cell division in the apical meristem as the there may no cell division in apical meristem the plant height decreases with increased level of naphthalenic acid which is clearly depicted in the figure 2 figure 3 figure 4 and figure 5 and the supporting factor for the decreased activity of xylobutan in the trans glycosylase can be clearly understood by the steam gauge result this is the result of what i have observed for the steam gauge that increased yen yield to small epidermal protuberances as shown in the figure these small protuberances were exactly the tissue proliferation of the mature parenchyma cells that is due to the depressed activity of xpt that is xylobutan in the trans glycosylase trans glycosylase and there was no significant difference in stream got with the external application of zeolic acid this is the result that i have observed for the days to 50% harvesting which is one of the most contributing factors for the higher yielding tomato for the farmers in nepal as the flowering and fruiting seasons are prolonged more will be the productive bread for the tomato farmer so ga average 50 ppm resulted ordinary in this to 50% flowering which might be due to the increased transpiration respiration photosynthesis which finally lead to the better accumulation of carbohydrate same was for the any average 25 ppm which is attained in early age just to 50% flowering which is due to the simultaneous transport of lower concentration of yen to auxiliary bodies which would have resulted in a better seed for the mobilization of photo assimilates at a faster rate and has helped in early transformation from vegetative to reproductive phase these are the results for the application of zeolic acid and naphthalene acetic acid for number of flowers per plant number of flowers per cluster number of flower clusters per plant as in phase by gnn what i observed was that the 50 ppm zeolic acid and 25 ppm nea was based for all these parameters and i have uh, concluded that the better vegetative growth might have to be related to these factors as this has better vegetative growth has enhanced the flower primordia with this concentration this is the effect of zeolic acid and naphthalene acetic acid on the fruit number as well as the average fruit weight what i observed was that the ga3 average 50 ppm lead to the higher yield due to the more number of fruits and increased fruit weight by the correlation analysis shown below the figure number 9 and yen at a rate higher concentration lead to less fruits as it increases as it induces the formation of abscissal layer resulting antagonistic effect of na at higher concentration which is supported by the various study conducted previously like the study of puo in 1991 and what i observed in on the four levels of ga3 ga3 at the 50 ppm lead to the higher yield which was 13.91% higher than the 0 ppm 10.31% higher than 25 ppm 6.74% higher than 75 ppm so i try to obtain the response equation of zeolic acid on yield for that i have obtained the regression some equation which has significant effect and the physical maximum dose of zeolic acid obtained by my study was 52.65 ppm with the yield of 99.75 ton per hectare actually what it means that if we will increase the application of zeolic acid at higher concentration above 52.65 ppm then it will be the meaningless for us as it won't increase the yield beyond 99.75 ton per hectare Same was the regression equation for NA. It was also the quadratic equation and the highest level of NA acceptable for the tomato plant for the better productivity was 20.29 metric ton per hectare, 21.29 ppm, which lead to 103.8 ton per hectare. So. My research ended with the conclusion that the zeolic acid at the rate 50 ppm and naphthalene acetic acid at the rate 25 ppm. Will be better under protected cultivation to boost the productivity in Kashi Nepal. 
these are the glimpses of the laboratory work for the preparation of jewelry case in a nephrinistic acid actually the overall goal was not to promote the use of jewelry case in a nephrinistic acid exactly it was to find out the exact concentration which must be suitable for the boosting the yield as the farmers are using the various trade mac of jewelry case in a nephrinistic acid coming from the indian market could have known the exact concentration that should be used These are the games of field activity like spray of the jewelry case, nephelin acid case, training, pruning, staking inside the protected horticulture. These are the games of the data observation. Uh, these are the games of quality test. And due to the time limitation, I have not put uh, the data on the quality test of the tomato by the application of jewelry case and nephelin acid case. Uh, these are the farmers that have visited the field to see the effect of the. Uh, in jewelry case and nephelin acid case and tomato thank you and at last like and at last i want to thank napa for providing me the financial support as well as the technical advices from mr sham kandel at each and every part of my research experiment thank you everybody for listening my presentation that's all Did we lose Max or not seen him here? Yeah, Max was here, you know. Oh my goodness! Uh, okay, no. I <laughs> I screwed up. I said all kinds of good stuff, and you didn't even hear. All right, so I'll repeat that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what I said earlier, and uh, I said in the mute, was uh, I'm quite impressed with uh, speaker so far. I want to make a midway comment. Uh, the quality of research and quality of presentations do not strike me as undergraduate research this is exceptional i see no better presentation than what i see this morning in my own university in in on my own department doing masters and phd so this is exceptional uh, quality work that you all have done so far and uh, i know that uh, we have a long way to go today and tomorrow to finish up but uh, seeing one after another exceptional research and exceptional presentation i congratulate to all of you with that a question for ritesh is are there any impacts of using pgrs in human health what do you say Ritesh, are you still, Mr. Yes, Dab? sir. Yes, sir. There are severe impacts of the use of jewelry acid and methylene acetic acid on human health. Like various potential disorders are occurring in methylene acetic acid. Okay, okay, okay. Right. Uh, sir, are you hearing me? Hello, Hada. Hello. Yeah, I hear okay. Sir, there are various impacts of the use of jewelry case and methyl case. As I have clearly mentioned, hmm? that my objective is to make the last change. Ram, Ram, equal, equal. Ram, sir, the issues. Uh, Doctor Powell, could you pause those who are not speaking? Perhaps. Thank you. Yes, sir. I have clearly mentioned that the objective or the goal was not to promote the use of jewelry case and methyl in acetic acid, just to make the farmer aware. what concentration should be used to boost the yield what might be the exact concentration for the better yield and growth for the tomato plant exactly what happened in case of nephil scenario and in caski farmers are using the packets of pgr 
unnecessary at any time in your thumb so to boost the yield without knowing what concentration to be used and uh, this has significantly lead to the various effects which have not been studied yet in nepal but the research shows that the use of jabiri acid has many congestion disorder like uh, breast elongation in case of women as well as lead to the mental retardedness as a research study conducted in kerala showed the effect of the uh, various uh, pesticides as well as the hormones on the cashew plantation like uh, the children are still mumbling they are up to the seven years as well as there have been occurring the mental retardedness among various people uh, when there are excessive use of these chemicals so uh, the better is that stop the use of the chemicals or hormones or any pesticides go towards the organic but if not then we should be better acknowledge about the concentration what to be used and i think up to the 50 ppm jabiric acid it won't be harmful as in nepal the farmers as well as the traders are using the small concentration of jabiric acid up to 25 ppm 10 ppm even for the post harvest treatment in case of tomato so all the treatment that i have used on tomato plant was before the flowering so its effect may not come to the consumer after the harvest all the effect having so on the reproductive development only that's also uh, one very quick question from myself here uh, how about the the quality control or the amount there are no real regulations that people can follow in nepal because uh, i mean the, the you know the, there are no stricter rules so who controls uh, or who teaches farmers to apply uh, correct uh, doses of these pgrs so what what's the quality control aspect basically i was on the prime minister agriculture modernization project uh, in kaski nepal at that time i visited a lot of farm and the same question encountered in my mind that what will be the solution so that the farmer will follow the recommendation given by the expert as well as researcher in the present field of agriculture and i came to know that the, there were groups of the farmers like sangal so called sangal krishak sangal in uh, in nepal uh, which is been organized by the pme and the prime minister agriculture modernization project currently and in that meeting i have uh, presented my view and the farmers were in my field to see the observation and yet uh, i am waiting uh, for any uh, necessary step by the government organization so that there will be the strict rules and regulation to control the use of excessive pgr and if the farmers are uh, trying to use then they should be using with proper uh, regulations of required concentration uh, but this is uh, quite difficult in nepal uh, and this is known to all of us certain certain thank you very much for again another great presentation thank you okay no, let's sir. move on to next presentation uh, varietal evaluation of promising maize genotypes in mid hills of nepal by bipin neupane from ias uh, i see that uh, our own dr wagle is uh, napa advisor from here and local advisor ankur paude so mr neupane please go thank you sir uh, <clears throat> the title for my research is the varietal evaluation of the promising maize genotypes in mid hills of nepal next please Uh, let me start with the introduction as you all know that the maize is the second most important cereal crops in terms of area and production after paddy rice in nepal uh, and also the, there is a growing trend of hybrid maize in nepal but still we are limited to the productivity of 2.5 metric ton per hectare uh, and the hybrid maize covers less than 10% of the over total maize area in nepal the main factor uh, that drives us to uh, this study is that the most of the release varieties are trial at research station only but not in the field condition that may be due to the lack of proper extension also the some of the release varieties are not even accepted by the farmers due to lower than expected level of production and also according to tripathi and his team on 2016 the release hybrids are not even competitive with multinational variety in case to nepal so we set our objective uh, as to identify the superior genotypes by comparing the jomplasma of release and multinational maize varieties and to uh, evaluate their adaptability on the 
farmer's field condition and to analyze the relationship of the maize grain yield with other ill attributing parameters. Next slide. Now, when you come to material uh, metrology, uh, the experimental site of the uh, study was Sundar Bazar uh, with an experimental period of May to September 2019. The experimental design was RCBD with 14 treatments and 3D application with a plot size of 5 meter into 2 meter and a spacing of 75 centimeter into 25 centimeter. As per the recommendation by National Maize Research Program, the fertilizer dose used was 120 to 60 to 40 NPK kg per hectare. Here in table one, we can see the list of the 14 genotypes that I have uh, that we have been used uh, that we have used as a treatment uh, for our research. Among them, five are uh, the release hybrid, five are the pipeline hybrid, and four are the multinational hybrid. Next slide. Next one. Uh, thank you. Uh, here, this table shows the quantitative and the qualitative characters that were recorded during uh, the study along with the evaluation phase. Here we can see that we have studied 17 quantitative characters and nine qualitative characters during our study. Next. Now, when you come for result and discussion, from the table here, we can see that uh, it is the table for the comparison of the maize genotypes for the characters. And uh, when we look for the column of treatment, we can see that all the 14 genotypes were significant with each other for the 17 quantitative characters that we have studied, uh, as we can see there. And also while looking for the CV percentage, our CV percentage range from 0.69 for plant height to 27.55 for uh, Air aspect. Uh, we have seen that the most of our characters have the CV percent of less than 10 percent, indicating that there is less dispersion or the less distribution of the data. Next. Next slide. Okay, uh, here the table shows the estimation of the genetic parameters for the 17 characters in the hybrid maze. When you see the phenotypic coefficient of variance and the genotypic coefficient of variance, we can see that PCV is greater than GCV for all the characters we have studied. It shows that the variation is not only genetic, but also is influenced by the environment. But still, the gap between the PCV and GCV is small. So we can say that the characters are less affected by the environment and the selection based on the phenotype is uh, effective. And when you go for the heritability, we can see that most of our traits are highly heritable in nature. That is the selection of this phenotype on the, uh, this uh, character based on the phenotype is effective. But still, according to Ray Choudhury and Ta 2011, high heritability coupled with high genetic advance as per mean is more effective and reliable in predicting the selection. So uh, here we can see in the red uh, color, there are the four characters, number of your per plant, uh, tassel branching, thousand grain weight, and grain yield are the four characters that have high heritability coupled with high genetic advance as per mean. And uh, the selection of these uh, characters are effective. Next slide. Here we can see the correlation of the 17 characters in the hybrid maze, where the green color signifies the significant positive correlation, while the orange color signifies the significant negative correlation. Since our main focus is on the grain yield, we can show that we can see that the grain yield has shown positively significant correlation with number of year per plant and stem growth or the stem diameter, and a significantly negative correlation with anthesis silking interval. Next. Here we can see the uh, cluster. Uh, here the table is uh, shows the cluster mean for the 17 characteristics in hybrid maze. We have been able to uh, classify our 14 genotypes into four clusters, and uh, among that, uh, the cluster one incorporated the five genotypes with the highest average mean for grain yield. Since our main focus is grain yield, so the genotypes under the cluster one could be effective for the selection. Also. Uh, when you look for the cluster four, uh, four and the cluster one, uh, the, they have highest um, average mean for many of the characters. So for the further crop improvement and development and for in case for grain yield, the genotypes under cluster one and cluster four uh, could be selected. Next. Here, the figure shows the dendrogram of the 14 hybrid maize genotypes for quantitative character. We have been able uh, to uh, cluster our genotypes in uh, four different cluster by using complete linkage Euclidean distance method. Next slide. Here, 
this figure shows the frequencies of the qualitative characters in the maize gene types that we have studied. The qualitative characters were the tests of the bloom based color, silk color at emergence, leaf pubescence, leaf color, leaf orientation, leaf width, corner row arrangement, hox cover, and grain texture. Next. Now, as for conclusion, we can see that the varieties Pioneer, Rampur Hybrid 6, Ganga Kaberi, and Pariposa were found to be superior genotypes. From this uh, sentence, we can clear, uh, clarify that among the four superior genotypes, three were the multinational varieties. So we can conclude that the multinational varieties had greater adaptability than the locally released hybrid varieties in case to middles of the Nepal. Also, the grain yield showed significantly positive correlation with number of years per plant and steam got suggesting that these characters should be considered for future breeding program. Also, as already discussed, the high heritability coupled with high genetic advance was seen for four characters, grain yield, tessel branching, thousand grain weight, and number of years per plant, indicating that there's a presence of additive gene action and there is less environmental effect for this character. Next slide. Now, for way ahead, we can see that there are tremendous opportunity for the future maize breeding program. As we have already seen, there is the presence of huge genetic variability among the maize genotypes, but still the evaluation of these varieties under multi-year and multi-site trails is required to assess their adaptability under varying climatic condition. And our prime focus is on national maize research program as uh, they need to strengthen their research extension and the farmer linkage. Next. Uh, at last, uh, I would also like to inform you that we have already submitted two peer review articles for publication from this work. Uh, and uh, at last, I would like to thank you, uh, both of my advisors and Napa for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Another great presentation. Let me pose you a couple of questions as I see on the chat box. Uh, one question is, uh, multinational varieties need to be specified. Can you specify what, what are those multinational varieties? Uh, the multinational uh, uh, species were uh, Pariposa, Ganga Kaveri, uh, Pioneer, and Rasi. And the other question and I have is... mentioned. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, sir. I have mentioned that in the uh, uh, motor and metrology slide. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Uh, there is another question which is more sustainable, multinational variety or local variety? Uh, I think uh, the multinational variety is more sustainable because. Uh, because as, as we have already seen in conclusion that they have the higher, uh, they were the superior genotypes. And also they are, uh, when I visited the market, we have found that multinational hybrid were uh, less, in price for, uh, less in price for the uh, purchase also. And also they are showing the greater adaptability to the farmer's field and they have some the higher grain. So I think multinational variety is sustainable than the local variety uh, according to my research. How about the quality or uh, likability, adaptability, uh, consumers, uh, acceptability, probably the test will be a little different. Can you say anything on that? Uh, yeah, of course, uh, um, basically in Lomjung, the, all of the uh, farmers are using the multinational variety. And uh, what we have found is the lack of the uh, national uh, maize research program uh, that they are not able to provide the uh, quality hybrid seed for them. Uh, so uh, the scenario in Nepal is that the multinational hybrid, uh, hybrid are, are in top and the release hybrid are in uh, are not uh, are not getting that much height that they should have got uh, and uh, also the release uh, hybrid are not that much productive uh, so i think farmer uh, prefer multinational variety rather than the uh, release variety certainly that's a good point uh, of course the the yield productivity and uh, so forth will favor the multinational varieties but there is a follow up questions does that mean that we should discard the local variety um, and go my research has not uh, go 100% okay. to multinational. Uh, thank you for your question. I think uh, we should not discard the uh, local variety, but that the local variety could be used as a uh, parental, uh, parental form to, for the further breeding program and the crop improvement. And we have already discussed what were the characters that should be considered for the future breeding uh, according to heritability JM. And by looking that, we can uh, select the local variety and add up some of the best characters from local variety uh, from the breeding perspective. Excellent. Thank you. And there will be a few more comments sent to your way. Excellent presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, we are moving toward the end of the presentation. We, we still have one more, correct, Dr. Powder?
Yes, I think Suruchi is trying to share her screen. If you okay. want to share Suruchi, go ahead. Okay. Next uh, presenter is uh, Sirisa Acharya from uh, uh, Campus of Life Sciences, Bang, uh, again. Uh, and the title is Effect of Different Types of Fertilizers on Vitamin C Content of Cauliflower uh, in Dang District. It's a group project, but uh, Sirisa is presenting. Greetings, everyone. I'm Sirisa Acharya, representing Cauliflower UPA Group of Midwest Academy and Research Institute, Campus of Life Sciences, Tulsipur Dang. The title of our research is Effect of Different Types of Fertilizer on Vitamin C Content of Cauliflower. So without further ado, I'd like to start my presentation. Cauliflower, Brassica oleracea barbotritis, is an annual plant belonging to Brassicaceae family that reproduces by seed and is considered beneficial due to its special combination of phytochemicals called carotenoids, tocopherols, and ascorbic acid. Cod is an edible part of cauliflower that contains considerable amount of vitamin C content. The main objectives of our research is to find out the effect of different types, both organic and inorganic fertilizers, on vitamin C content of cauliflower. Whereas from this research experiment, we would also be able to know the relation of different fertilizers on different parameters like yield, cord, cord diameter, weight, and vitamin C content of cauliflower. And also we would be able to understand the cultivation practices and be able to define best possible fertilizers for the optimum vitamin C content. Materials and methods. For our research, materials required including seeds, fertilizers, and chemicals were brought from nearby market, while other accessory materials were used from horticultural lab of Maricols. Location of experiment, horticultural research area Maricols, Tulsipur Dang. Three months long research study was conducted from first week of September to second week of December, 2019. We, we used randomized complete block design for the experimentation purpose with seven treatments replicated three times, which makes 21 plots in total. For the experimental setup, factors or the treatments were different types of fertilizer that are compost, FYM, vermicompost, mustard cake, without fertilizer that is controlled, poultry manure, and inorganic fertilizer, NPK. Out of total plot area, 182.16 meter square, 120.96 meter square was transplanted. Space between the plots was one meter and block separation between them, 0.5 meter. Before sowing, soil sample was taken from 0 to 20 centimeter depth diagonally from five spots of each treatment and was analyzed. Crop variety used for experimentation purpose was white cup and seedling development was done in a plastic tray using cocoa pit as displayed in the slide. Each plot size of 7.2 meter square was prepared for seedling transplantation and transplanted at 30, 60 by 60 row to row and plant to plant spacing at four to five centimeter depth after five weeks of seedling development in a plastic tray. Twice hand weeding and weighing was done during the crop growth period in the field and odding up was done after 30 days after transplanting. Also, a split dose of nitrogen was applied and irrigated thrice a week. Fertilizers or treatment dose at the time of seedling transplantation are as follows. FYM 18 ton per hectare, compost 15 ton per hectare, inorganic fertilizer NPK 120 is to 60 is to 60 kg per hectare. Mustard cake was applied at the rate of seven ton per hectare and 10 ton vermicompost. 10 ton per hectare vermicompost was used. Six parameters were evaluated from four sample plants, excluding border plants from each treatments and replications. Plant height, leaf number, and stem diameter were evaluated at 30 and 45 days after transplanting, whereas cord diameter, yield, and vitamin C content was evaluated at the time of harvesting. Diameters were measured using vernier caliper, and leaf numbers were hand counted. Yield was estimated by calculating net cord weight and multiplied by total number of plants for treatment. Vitamin C content was determined by titration method from 100 gram of cauliflower cord extract by using the following formula shown in the slide. The obtained data were tabulated in Microsoft Excel and analyzed by ADLR software. The result of analysis are as follows. Plant height was found to be highest in case of mustard cake, measuring 31.8 cm and 38.8 cm at 30 and 45 days respectively, followed by FYM and lowest in case of control. Leaf number, no significant difference was seen in leaf number, but was seen highest in case of vermicompost and lowest in case of control. Steam diameter was recorded significantly higher in mustard cake at both 30 and 45 days after transplanting, measuring 1.8 cm and 
1.3 centimeter respectively, 1.38 centimeter respectively, sorry, while lowest was recorded in case of control with the value of 0.55 centimeter and 0.63 centimeter at 30 and 45 days respectively. NPK showed highest influence in cord diameter, that is 17.28 centimeter was recorded, while 9.96 centimeter was recorded as lowest measurement in control treatment. Mustard cake showed highest contribution in yield parameter with 8.56 ton per hectare, whereas only 2.8 ton per hectare was harvested from control treatment. Vermicompost contributed highest in case of vitamin C content followed by poultry manure and lowest by control. Highest vitamin C content calculated was 33.09 mg per 100 gram cord extract, whereas lowest calculated was 14.66 mg per 100 gram cord extract. Same research was with same treatment and replication were conducted previous year as well in horticultural research area of Maricos in Tulsipur Dang, but results obtained were not similar. Previous year, NPK showed highest influence in plant height, leaf number, and stem diameter. But this year, mustard cake showed highest, highest in plant height and stem diameter and vermicompost in case of leaf number. Previous year, mustard cake was reported to have highest influence in cord diameter, whereas this year, cauliflower cords with NPK treatment showed maximum cord diameter. In case of yield and vitamin C content, both studies showed same result, that is highest influence in yield by mustard cake and highest influence in vitamin C content by vermicompost. But previous year, Highest yield recorded was 10.75 ton per hectare, whereas this year it is 8.56 ton per hectare. Maximum vitamin C content reported in vermicompost application this year is 33.09 mg per 100 gram cord weight, whereas previous year it was on just 16.41 mg per 100 gram weight. In spite of same treatments and replication, difference in results occurred. This may be due to external environment condition, slight alteration in sowing there, that is previously it was conducted from August first week to second week of November. We started from first week of September till second week of December. Seedlings were raised in cocoa pit this year, but previous year it was done in a nursery bed. And few soil properties may have changed in a one year interval. So to conclude, among all the treatments attempted, most are cakes showed maximum influence in yield attribute, whereas for increased vitamin C content, vermicompost is recommended. Here are some glimpses of our research. Thank you. I'd like to thank all the respondents, our advisor, Manoj Bosnitsar, Napa and RCBC, family and friends. Thank you. OK, I almost. He spoke on mute here. Okay, thank you, Sirisa, again for uh, another great presentation. Um, I have a couple of questions for you. Number one, why was vitamin C in cauliflower considered the major area of study? What's the significance? You know, cauliflower doesn't seem to be vitamin C rich vegetable. So why why vitamin C research on cauliflower? Vitamin C content is found to be significantly fairer than other vitamins in cauliflower. Okay. Okay. So I hope the questioner is satisfied with this. Second question. Uh, why do you think the result differs despite using same experimental procedure in two different locations? What are the locational differences causing that difference result? So as I already explained, the external it could be external environment conditions, and this year it was raised in a cocoa pit, uh, which is very increased in by very increased in nutrients. But previous year it was done in a nursery bed, and within a year of interval, so a few soil properties may also have been changed. Okay. But major major parameters gave the same results. That is yield and vitamin C content. Sure. Maybe soil differences, soil type differences. Sir? Difference in soil types. No, sir, not difference in soil type, but few small physical properties okay. could have been changed. Okay. There is one more question here. Did you analyze nutrients in vermicompost and other amendments? So do you know the nutrient and uh, nutrient uh, status of those 
uh, input. No, so we didn't analyze. Okay. And there is one more question here. Have you, okay, uh, you didn't analyze, but is there a report in the literature that uh, can you see what would be the nutrient constituents of those vermicompost? Yes, sir. There are some few literature review that states the organic uh, matter in vermicompost. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> since you are the last one, we'll, we'll pose you lots of questions. No, no, I'm just kidding. Okay, how do you control those differences while analyzing data? That's all I have in here. So, Sir? Mr. Mr. can you explain that? I'm not sure I got that. I will control those differences while analyzing data. I think he's talking. I didn't get the question. Did you account for the side difference? What he's asking. Waiting for that. Let me. Uh, about local uh, locational difference. Okay, okay. So you have the locational difference. Did you account for that? Maybe blocking those or anything like that. I doubt you did, but that's the question. And let no, me. No, sir. Pull there was a locational difference. Okay. Uh, another question is when you applied mustard seed cake and did you see any growth retardation when you applied the mustard seed? Growth retardation of plant? Uh-huh. Plant growth no. retardation. No? No, okay. sir. Okay. Uh, let's, let's do one more and then uh, we'll call it good. Why do you think uh, barmi Vermicompost application help boost vitamin C content in cauliflower. What's in the vermicompost that help boost the vitamin C? Vermicompost contains decomposed product by orthrom, which contains various nutrients, including vitamin C. So it must be iron. Okay. But I'll tell you this, uh, Sirisa, that uh, you did an awesome job of both doing research and uh, delivering your uh, uh, your results uh, so confidently. Congratulations. Okay, thank you. Thank you and uh, our next session is uh, just kind of opening up to everybody and uh, uh, doing a little plenary. But before that, uh, I want to take advantage of uh, Mike being on my hand and uh, uh, personally calling uh, Barsa, Ibu, Mani, Suruchi, Rites, Bipin, and Sirisa all uh, saying congratulations to you for a job well done. Uh, Napa is very, very, very proud of what you have done and delivered today. On behalf of the entire Napa membership and the RCBC committee and Napa EC, I congratulate you. Uh, and your advisors, both in Nepal and in the US or North America. Uh, and I open up for plenary discussion. Thank you very much. Back to you, uh, Dr. Dev. So this is Manus Karki. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank you everybody for your wonderful presentations. Uh, very good uh, research, uh, sir. I'm uh, the one who is not in the biological sciences, uh, the, the areas that you guys have done research in. Uh, I'm an engineer. However, uh, uh, from the gist of what you have presented, it looks really well uh, conducted research and uh, nicely presented work. Uh, again, congratulations everybody and really proud to uh, have you all in our uh, grant system and uh, in collaboration with us in conducting these uh, research projects. Uh, just a couple of uh, quick suggestions about the general presentations there, uh, uh, which uh, I believe um, not applicable for everybody and perhaps uh, you guys have already thought about, but still I would like to just uh, put it there for your consideration in the future. Um, again, in general, they're very nicely uh, prepared presentations, not uh, no, no major comments um, there. I just wanted to uh, bring up a few minor things. One, uh, 
most of you presented uh, relevant pictures at the end of the presentation. I don't know if this is a practice in the discipline that you guys are in or, or there is any guidelines from some of your uh, supervisors, but uh, I just uh, feel like those could be included in the presentation themselves, uh, in the presentation slides themselves in relevant locations. And you don't have to spend time talking about those. It just becomes very clear. For example, when you are talking about your uh, data collection efforts and your pictures uh, that is relevant to your data collection might be included there, just uh, giving us an even better sense of how that uh, data collection went. And you don't, again, then have to present your pictures separately at the end. Again, this is my personal uh, suggestion. It may or may not be valid in various situations. Two, uh, some of the slides were, uh, for some of the presenters, some of the slides were really heavy on text. And we generally try to keep the text at minimum and try to include visuals more frequently so that uh, it becomes a bit more appealing and more attractive to the, the audience. Certainly you could then use your own notes or, or you could use in the PowerPoint itself, you have an area where you can add notes, which will be your reference later to uh, discuss about what you have in the presentation. Uh, so again, there are a few slides with a lot of text and I, I thought that it could be improved slightly. Tables were, uh, in many cases, uh, too long, too big, and too many numbers. I think for the presentations like this, uh, we could reduce the number of uh, the size of tables to keep only the most important numbers there so that um, uh, the audience would have better time uh, looking at the important numbers and getting a sense of what, what the, the most important results were the larger full tables could be included in the papers and the reports that you write or prepare based on the these kinds of research activities again uh, there might be some differences due to the disciplinary differences we have between the research uh, projects you've conducted and and what i do but um, that's another thought i i kind of got during the presentation uh number four <clears throat> um uh it is uh, sometimes difficult and sometimes there are varying guidelines you might receive from different uh, or various uh, kind of opinion you might hear from different individuals. But uh, I generally prefer not to use the um, slide headings such as methodology or results because they repeat in multiple slides and, and sometimes we even write results continued. Um, rather, I uh, prefer using uh, more specific uh, headings for that specific slide. For example, within methodology, you may have uh, data collection approaches, you may have experimental design, you may have um, uh, performance evaluation matrix, mat uh, matrices, and, and these could be the specific uh, headings that you could use to make uh, individual slides more individualized rather than using methodology in five different slides. Again, those are some of the suggestions uh, that I felt uh, I would like to share. Again, it may or may not be valid um, in different situations. But again, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation and look forward to see you in some other venues and work with you in some other, um, other projects or other occasions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Karki, for uh, uh, very helpful uh, information that you shared with uh, our researchers. Uh, uh, of course, as you said, that uh, not all those comments are applicable to all speakers or all uh, sub-disciplines of agriculture. But in general, uh, using those guidelines will certainly help these young scientists, uh, would-be scientists. Uh, they are already scientists. They did exceptional research, and these comments will certainly help uh, improve their uh, uh, future presentations. Any other remarks from uh, RCBC uh, members, uh, NAPA uh, executive committees, uh, other listeners, uh, anyone uh, before we uh, uh, turn to our uh, uh, presenters themselves uh, to make few remarks. So, uh, Time in, guys. Well, I uh, just a few seconds. I just want to take a few seconds. Excellent presentations, and then I'm really impressed by the quality of research and presentation at undergraduate level. Uh, and this is very good uh, overall. So one, uh, I agree with uh, Dr. Karki's all good suggestions. 
So one quick suggestion is also in kind of virtual framework. Uh, if you are presenting a slide, uh, it is encouraged to turn on your video if you could. So that would, uh, would be more interactive. So that would be my quick observation uh, in, in presentation. Thank you. Any more re remarks? Uh, Dr. Uh, Lila Karki, if you are still there, you were president when you uh, began this uh, journey and uh, maybe a few remarks for these uh, speakers. Uh, Dr. Prasadili, make, make sir. Yes, sir. Uh, more funny, Oiliko, yeah, I'm very sad here. Good presentation, but I quit a master's student, not all of them are undergrad, some of them are master's student as well. They have done wonderful job, and uh, we have gone through their uh, reports as well. They, I mean, reports are very comprehensive, and some of them have already utilized the data to publish. Uh, uh, I mean, to write journal article and publish the articles in the journal as well. And uh, it is a wonderful, uh, it has been a wonderful collaboration, you know, and we look forward to working with you all. And uh, this said, uh, uh, and there are a couple of other advisors as well from NAPA, maybe Uma Karki, if you allow her to speak, uh, you know, for a few minutes, she may want to share her experience as well. Yeah, and she's raising hand, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's an open floor, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Parajuli, and good morning to all of you, and good evening, maybe, in Nepal now, right? Um, this is very exciting to listen to and to um, be a witness of the wonderful undergraduate. I think the all most of you are undergraduate students, if I understand correctly. Um, that is the wonderful quality you all have shown. Although there is always the room for improvement, even the veteran professionals always um, get uh, comments and um, input for improvement. That, that's the how the professional life uh, progresses. So you don't have to be like ashamed of or anything for getting any comments or questions. That's how the profession improves. So the I am very much impressed that which um, NAPA beginning this concept, bringing this mini grant. This is just the little token from whichever contributed. The great idea came from the leadership, NAPA leadership from this previous uh, executive committee. And now we are continuing this. Um, and I extremely um, suggest we have to continue this and on top of that, RCBC committee, or if we have any other committee, if you are going to do, we have to give them input how to prepare um, better presentation and uh, in terms of presenting numbers, uh, figures, and other illustration, even the font size, uh, what to present, what is not uh, essential to present for that limited time. Also, all these paper, I think, these are very quality papers that you guys need to prepare the paper and submit to the relevant journal. Um, GJS is one of the very potential journal that we look forward to receiving your papers. And I think the advisor will be um, helping you, young scientists, for preparing the journal article and submit. So with that, um, I see all the good future of these young scientists and all of us who are working together um, to, with a little contribution, making a big impact in the agricultural field in Nepal specifically and all over the globe in broad. With that, I would like to conclude my um, few sharing and we'll be communicating in the future. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Parajuli and the team for giving me this opportunity.
Thank you, Dr. Karki. Uh, there are at least three Dr. Karkis here. So thank you, Dr. Uma Karki, for your, uh, for your excellent remarks. And yes, I think NAPA is committed to continue this because we are more encouraged today uh, than ever before on the value of uh, these uh, mini research grants. Um, I, uh, I would ask uh, any of the presenters, uh, if you, you know, just anyone uh, say something if you like to, if not, we have to move on toward closing of the program. Any speakers from uh, Nepal? Just volunteer. Do we see any hand, Dr. Wagle? No. If not, then I like to invite uh, Dr. Nitya Khanal uh, from Canada. Uh, he is a current uh, executive committee member of NAPA uh, and uh, uh, incoming chairman of uh, this uh, program, RCBC. So Dr. Khanal, uh, if you say a few words on behalf of uh, advisors, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, Dr. Parajuli. Uh, and namaskar everyone. Um, uh, on behalf of all NAPA members, uh, I'd like to congratulate and thank you all presenters today. Uh, it is, I was familiar with all this research, what you have been doing uh, through uh, featuring your work in AgriConnection. So yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation and I feel really privileged to be a NAPA member and NAPA representing NAPA advisors today uh, in this closing remarks. So um, the students are groomed to such an excellent, actually I thoroughly enjoyed uh, communicating with uh, the advisee uh, Rupa Karna and uh, local advisor for him, uh, supposed to be Mahesh Regmi, uh, but uh, frequently I found uh, uh, he's citing his local advisor, academic advisor, uh, Dr. Sarban Kumar Saha. So yeah, uh, and I'd like to um, uh, uh, thank you uh, NAPA and uh, NAPA Executive Committee and, uh, and uh, NAPA um, RCBC Committee Research, research uh, and Capacity Building Committee for doing all this wonderful hard work from uh, fundraising through to soliciting proposals, evaluating proposals and uh, conducting uh, these uh, um, two uh, presentation sessions. So uh, uh, thank you very much. And uh, um, uh, I'd like to uh, see you again in different uh, forums. Thank you so much uh, for today. Thank you, Dr. Khanal, for your remarks. And uh, uh, before we close today's proceedings, uh, I like to uh, encourage and invite, personally request uh, all the speakers of today to join tomorrow also, so that you will see uh, another set of great presentations. And then you can compare your notes with them and you can tell them, hey, we are better yesterday than today or things like that, you know? Uh, so it is always great to have all the uh, all the presenters, all the researchers uh, uh, listen to other and give them the um, uh, give them the support. So I personally invite you to join again tomorrow, and not only today's uh, presenters and researchers, but all who have attended today. Uh, you know, you have not seen the other set of. Uh, presenters, uh, so you may be missing out on those. So please be sure to join tomorrow again, same time, same format, same forum. Until then, thank you very much. And uh, congratulations to all research and their advisors.
for job well done. Thank you, and we close today's proceeding. Good night for uh, Nepalese uh, audience. <laughs>